Okay, so now we are hearing from Reese Meekins. Uh, Reese is the manager of corporate strategy at MLG Oz uh, and, a, and a friend and customer of Forest Grove. Um, Reese, as you can imagine, is very passionate about data culture and he is doing great things with NIME uh, at MLG Oz with his team. They are at the start of their NIME journey, but uh, I think you'll really enjoy hearing what Reese has to say. So welcome, Reese. Thank you, Betsy. There's some very kind words. Um, to be honest, I'm not really doing a lot. Um, I've got manager and strategy in my job title. Um, I sit around and make PowerPoints while the team does all the work facilitated by uh, the tech stack that we've put in place. Um, I've got to say that was a pretty hard act to follow from both Fred and David, um, Jewel Lux and, uh, and Main Roads, you know, whether it's Main Roads WA or any Main Roads um, entity would be a household name in any jurisdiction. Um, MLG is probably a little bit of an unknown for a lot of people who've joined the audience. So I'll just give you a brief overview as to who we are and what we do. Um, MLG is a mining services provider. We operate uh, predominantly in Western Australia, but also in the Northern Territory of Australia as well. The company was founded around about 20 years ago um, by one man who borrowed some money from his parents to purchase a truck and trailer and haul silica for BHP at that time. Um, and that business has grown very significantly since Murray founded it 20 years ago. Um, and we now have a huge integrated product offering and service offering to our clients. Um, we're still true to our origins as a bulk haulage company, but we also now do civil construction work and site works, crushing and screening. Um, we've got our own quarries and supply um, sand, cement and lime products and also do logistics out of a port um, down in Esperance in the south of Western Australia. We operated, as I say, um, right across regional WA um, and into the Northern Territory. And that's really important for some reasons that I'll go into later around our data culture. Uh, in terms of the scale of the business, um, we've got over 640 people. Um, that number changes uh, and grows every single day. So um, that's definitely out of date as of uh, a week ago when I put that on the slide. We've got around, um, oh, well, over 30 different locations. and um, a turnover from our statutory financials last year was almost 260 million, and that's continuing to grow year on year uh, to the point where now this business is publicly listed and, um, and is going gangbusters. And these are some really important elements um, in shaping our data culture. Um, so this isn't just a history exercise, uh, and I'll go on to some of those reasons a little bit later for you. Now, in terms of where we're at in our uh, our analytics and our reporting journey, um, Betsy mentioned earlier that we are sort of towards the beginning of our formal data analytics and reporting strategy. And if I throw a fairly um, textbook looking maturity curve on the page, um, I'll be really honest in our assessment and say that we are towards the, the bottom end of that curve or the initial stages. And some of the key hallmarks of us or any organization that would be in that position um, would be a heavy reliance on Excel for, uh, for your analytics and reporting, data siloed in your disparate application databases, reporting generally coming natively from those source applications or, or maybe some extracts that are punched into Excel. Analysis is generally quite ad hoc. Um, scheduled reports tend to be static in nature, emailed, PDF, that sort of stuff. Um, Minimal formal governance around data um, or, or structure around that governance program. Data capture often quite manual, uh, and I'll go into some of the reasons for that uh, a little bit later on. And also a lack of or, or minimal common data definitions. Now, obviously we wanna be right up the optimized uh, point of that curve, but again, realistically, uh, any organization starting at the bottom has a long way to go. And we're pitching our strategy at the moment to get us um, towards the mid to upper sort of two thirds of that maturity curve. Um, and we're gonna do that by building a series of data marts and eventually an enterprise data warehouse. We wanna automate our data flows. We wanna increase the automation of our data capture and not necessarily get to full automation of data capture. Uh, pen and paper may always play a bit of a part for us, but let's get it as automated as we can. Um, and also getting a really effective um, governance structure in place uh, and our data culture is gonna be critical in driving that. 
Accessible reference data architecture, uh, which will facilitate self-service BI is again, a critical part of our strategy. And our production reports and visualizations for the time being are gonna be centrally deployed because of the size of our organization and the way we're structured, uh, we're not gonna have um, sort of fully disparate teams yet. Um, which may be something similar to what to what Fred and his team are doing at Dulux. We will still manage production centrally, but, but allow self-service BI. If the business grows to the kind of scale that we're talking about internally, um, I'm sure that will change in due course. Now, culture is uh, what we're here to talk about today. And um, to understand your culture, you have to look at the environmental factors and the organizational factors um, that have shaped it. Um, define what that culture is and look at then how do you turn the dial on that. So for us working in mining services, um, we have some constraining influences around our culture. The work environment is incredibly remote and incredibly distributed. Uh, our sites are hundreds of kilometres away from regional regional centres uh, and you, you could see from that map earlier that you really are out in the middle of nowhere. We do have a legacy of um, tech barriers that are embedded in the culture. Uh, and that's really because of that work environment. So as an industry, we've had to rely on pen and paper for so long. Um, we haven't been able to put sensors um, onto equipment to automate data capture because you're operating in tough, rugged environments. Um, temperatures in excess of 45 degrees Celsius, um, you know, often higher than 60 degrees Celsius uh, out there exposed in the sun. Uh, rocky terrain, dusty terrain, which means that capturing data um, automatically can be very difficult off um, capital equipment. Uh, and then of course, you've got to actually get that data somewhere. Um, so lack of uh, cloud technology in the past and just sheer lack of network connectivity is a massive issue. Um, and that's created a constraint around um, our culture as well as the actual technical data collection. Computer literacy of the workforce um, is a constraining influence as well. Um, we have some incredibly good people in this business, really good operators uh, of road trains, of loaders, and incredibly good site managers. Um, but we're not paying them to sit in front of a computer all day. We're paying them to go and operate multi-million dollar machinery. Um, so as a result, their competency is great in what drives our results. but they're not necessarily that great with computer literacy and understanding why, uh, why data might be very important to their role uh, and to the business. Now, we're in a relatively low margin industry. Um, mining makes a lot of money, but mining services um, are the poor kids that just get squeezed in the middle. Um, so that tends to stifle investment um, and also means you can't necessarily carry a huge corporate overhead. Now, at MLG as well, we're a a, a medium-sized business that's grown quite quickly. Um, so traditionally, we've had a very small corporate or group overhead, um, and you then don't have roles like mine, for example, to sit around and make pretty PowerPoints all day uh, and start to drive some of these programs. Um, David made an interesting point earlier about the uptake of NIME um, at Main Roads WA replacing um, native tooling. And that's certainly something that we'll be looking at here at MLG and has, has been coming across my desk already. Line of business applications natively are often fairly substandard with reporting. Um, they're really great at what they do and reporting tends to be an afterthought. Um, and that again, shapes your culture. People are used to getting what they get. They, deter they define data and analytics through the lens that they understand. And that's the, the lackluster reports they've been getting for years. Um, and finally, our sites are also run very independently. They're several hundred kilometers away from one another. Um, the workforce is generally fly in, fly out. So they're very self-contained and that leads to silos um, and also disparate business process um, and, and underpinning data models as a result. Now, this is all super negative. What are the positives that are gonna help us move the dial with our data culture? Uh, we have a very engaged senior leadership. Um, our managing director has taken this business um, from something that's been incredibly small to something that's been incredibly successful and continues to grow um, and improve. His drive and his vision um, has been essential and will continue to be, but also our, our senior leadership team underneath him and our middle management team are incredibly engaged in what we're trying to do with data and analytics. And so pushing that from the top down culturally is incredibly, incredibly important. 
we've got a strong culture in the business of innovation and improvement and of customer service. Um, and trying to tie your data culture and your analytics strategy back to your corporate culture for mine is essential. Uh, and I think for a guy like me, I've just lucked out that we have an incredibly strong corporate culture here. So uh, that makes my job nice and easy. And emerging and maturing technology. Uh, I said earlier that technology um, or can create a legacy um, in, in your culture, but it maturing technology and emerging technology can facilitate cultural change. Um, Starlink satellite, um, when that's rolled out, will be a massive game changer for mining services and mining or anyone that's operating remotely. Um, 4G, 5G and cloud software as a service and IoT, um, as those technologies have been introduced in the last sort of 10, 15 years and continue to mature, um, people will start to see that things don't have to be the way that they've always, always been. Now, a lot of discussion around culture, um, but why is that important? Um, why can't we just go and buy some cool tools, throw them in and get what we want? And the simple answer is that our frontline staff control a lot of key data capture points at the moment. And even when we look to automate some of that data capture, they may still control inputs. So we need them to understand why what they're doing is important and what the value of that is to the business, to our customers and to themselves. Uh, and looking at this table, which is by no means exhausted, uh, exhaustive, I should say, some of these data elements are really critical to understanding how we run our business. Um, our production data, the, uh, the product and the routes that we haul things on for our customers ultimately impacts on their ability to run their organisations and, and also our ability to make money. That's, that's where our revenue is generated. Um, our asset data and our people data are huge. Um, our business is very capital intensive. So we kind of say half the business is people and the other half is equipment. So understanding where those people are, what they're doing at any given point in time, where the equipment is, what it's doing, um, how it's being used um, and how it's being maintained is critical. Maintenance is big for us, not just for keeping equipment uh, out there in use, but also for keeping our staff safe. Um, and so looking at our collection and reporting around our safety data is really critical. Uh, and finally, purchasing and inventory data. Uh, obviously, with all of that capital gear, we have to spend a lot of money to maintain that. So making sure that we're receiving our inventory, that we know where that is, that we have integrity around our inventory balances, um, and also that we are purchasing through the right channels at the right time um, to make sure we're optimising our spend. So with all that in mind, what are we doing about it at MLG? What have we done uh, and what are we continuing to do? We're trying to generate awareness within our work groups of the importance of data, um, getting them aware of it and getting them to buy in. There's some of the ways that we can do that. We have done that uh, through direct incentives, things like gift vouchers and team lunches, um, where we have people you know, constantly performing well, they're selecting the right products on um, uh, head units and things that are in the cab of the loader or on a tablet located in their trucks. Uh, we're looking at indirect incentives. So um, if you know that the data that you are a part of creating is used to calculate a bonus that either you're getting paid on or your manager is getting paid on, um, there's a little incentive there indirectly to make sure that data is timely and accurate. Um, there's a few points that are, are really probably common from our previous speakers as well, um, and that's the demand um, for reporting and analytics products. Uh, what we are finding is that when people know what's possible, they start to demand more from us, um, and that helps us to drive data quality. All of a sudden, people know um, that that data is, uh, is available, uh, they know what it looks like, and they're going to make sure that it gets better. Our senior leadership buy-in, I mentioned that before, we've aligned um, our program of work with our organisational values um, and they're pushing the message down. Uh, and finally, governance structure. It's assigning clear accountabilities for data quality, um, embedding data stewards within the line of business, um, within our HR maintenance teams in particular, um, to make sure that these are not vague concepts that we're talking about and that someone actually has ownership um, of that data quality on a day-in, day-out basis. It's all well and good to talk about how you can create it, but um, at some point you do need to put the tools uh, and the training in place to enable a data aware culture as well uh, and to translate the desire, that drive that um, our people want the data um, 
Fred's people want the data, David's people want the data, um, we need to put the toolkit in place to drive that desire into the behaviour that we want. Um, so obviously, as a starting point, you need to put the infrastructure in place. So uh, we've invested in NIME Server and Microsoft Power BI to make that happen for us here at MLG. Identify, train and coach our power users. Um, so we've got some analysts distributed across the business and we will grow that network um, as the business grows uh, and as we mature our, our infrastructure. Agile development is really key for us. Um, we're deploying rapidly and regularly so that people are starting to see runs on the board um, as opposed to this being a large scale project that maybe, you know, gets a little bit stifled and doesn't deliver for a year or two on end. Um, and Fred mentioned this um, earlier. It's demonstrating to people what's possible. Um, so we've had uh, our first hackathon last week, which sounds um, probably not dissimilar to what Dualux are doing with their data community and meeting up regularly. Um, so we've just been getting together informally to um, muck around and see what we can find. Uh, and that's a very casual sort of Friday afternoon session that we're now doing once a month. Um, more formally, we've been building POCs to help our users understand what's possible um, and sort of, I guess, take the blinkers off their thinking a little bit. Uh, and look, wouldn't be here today if I didn't give a little bit of a plug um, to our hosts. NIME has been a key enabler for us. Um, it's ease of use and the integrated data governance are the reasons why we at MLG selected it as a key pillar of our data and analytics strategy. Um, the graphical interface uh, is allowing a guy like me who plays in PowerPoint all day to actually build workflows um, and create dashboards that actually have real data in them as opposed to just shapes. Uh, we're building a uniform integration layer for greater transparency. Um, our data integration previously is, um, you know, pretty standard 200 line PowerShell scripts and things like that. So providing a transparent layer centrally to show that back to people is easier to support, um, but also helps to drive governance and understanding. Um, rapid POC deployment is, is facilitated very easily by NIME and without you needing to make an upfront investment as well, which is how we started um, at MLG. Uh, and what I'm looking forward to in time is replacing our data capture spreadsheets with the NIME portal uh, to validate that data on its way through. In time, we'll get to the top end of that curve and automate all our data capture. But in the meantime, uh, I see NIME playing a really key point in, uh, in bringing that all together for us. So it's been an exciting journey so far. Um, it's only pretty early for us here at MLG, um, but really looking forward to seeing where this thing's going to take us. And like I say, with NIME at a critical point in the middle of that. Um, look forward to any questions that anyone's posting up there earlier. And um, if you have uh, ever want to get in touch, just feel free to reach out. Thanks, Reese. That was really great. Um, and we certainly appreciate your transparency. You know, these are, you know, the data literacy and culture curve is a um, is a long one. It's a long journey. So appreciate that. Um, look, can you tell us about any quick wins that you've had with Nine since you've started on this journey in terms of use cases, applications? Yeah. Yeah, I've probably got two there, Betsy. Um, we ran a POC um, with Forest Grove, funnily enough. Um, which you would be aware of. Uh, and that was a quick win for us in, in reconciling our um, goods received, not invoiced account. Um, for anyone who deals with inventory, um, GRNI has a habit of being an enormous black hole, incredibly difficult to reconcile. And the way that ERPs um, tend to run these, um, these accounts doesn't make it easy for the accountants. So we had a massive win with that. Um, I can't divulge the, uh, the positive P&L impact that we had, but um, did have a little happy CFO after that one. Um, culturally, um, what's surprised me the most and been a massive win is how our IT team and our senior developer has taken to NIME. I expected yeah. him to be a little bit resistant on the basis that he can do what NIME can do, um, scripting things himself. Um, uh -huh. But he's actually, um, this week has blown me away with what he's produced in NIME and his enthusiasm for using the product. Um, and so for me, uh, with what we're trying to drive in the business, that's more important than um, than even getting some tangible outcomes in terms of, um, you know, dashboarding or, or reporting products. Yeah, that's massive. That's really big. Um, and 
look, you, you've sort of answered my next question, which was about the response to the new technology. So that's really fantastic to hear. Um, what are you most excited about achieving with NIAM next? What use case are you thinking, this is going to be really cool, this is going to make a difference? Yeah, we've got... Um... We've got a lot of data in this business and we've invested heavily in the infrastructure to collect that data. Um, mm -hmm. So all of our heavy machinery, Caterpillar Komatsu gear um, have sensors on it. So measuring things like fuel burn rates, um, software codes, um, you know, maintenance codes and things like that in the engine control yeah. units. Um, we've got similar aftermarket technology in our prime mover fleet. Um, with GPS locations and things like that. So there's some pretty cool data that's sitting out there just ready to be mined. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to those. And um, Angus at Forest Grove did a little um, image recognition proof of concept for us a few weeks ago. Um, mm. And I think there's some pretty cool stuff we can do in that space. Um, Utilising NIME to pass imagery um, whether that's from, from PDFs or from cameras and, uh, and analyze that data. So yeah, some pretty exciting stuff coming up. Yeah, really good. Really great to hear. And, um, thanks again, Reese. No worries. Pleased to be here. Thank you.